Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's the one o'clock clock on a given Thursday. We're talking global connections today. Um, we're talking about vaccines for the world with a worldly person indeed, Carlos Juarez, who joins us here from Honolulu because he is now affiliated with the East West Center. And that's a very worldly organization. Hi, Carlos. Good, good day. Good to see you, Jay, always. And, uh, you know, we've been connecting so many years as I've been well, from different parts of the world, happy to say I'm back home after a very long sojourn that's taking me to, you know, to Europe, to India, to Mexico, to Texas, but back home at long last here. Uh, and again, as we've been doing uh, in a number of different shows, you know, looking at the evolving uh, dynamics of the, the vaccine program now, the challenge of the pandemic. And it's interesting, you think right now in the U.S., in some ways, uh, I saw, I was reading an article earlier uh, making a reference to the United States being the first major country to enter a post-pandemic world, if we can even call it that. But obviously the vaccine program here in the last month or two has certainly moved forward uh, substantially. Uh, and so what we're now seeing as well, and given the, the recent uh, meetings in Europe last week, the G7 summit in particular, uh, efforts by the US and other world leaders to try to promise and, and roll out uh, more vaccines to the other world, the rest of the world. And, and it's, a, you know, it's important, it's, a, it's something, obviously there's a, there's a moral imperative um, it's the inequality of, you know, the wealthy countries that have up to now afforded everything, but it remains a challenge in some places, Africa in particular, some other parts of the developing world where, you know, it's one thing to promise the vaccines, it's another thing to really make it happen. And, and, and for these places that have pretty weak institutions and capacity to begin with, you know, how they're going to be able to, to move it forward. But yeah, that's where, that's where we are. Yeah. So what's in it for the U.S.? Let's assume that Joe Biden is able to um, you know, produce and um, deliver uh, millions, hundreds of millions of vaccine doses uh, around the world, especially to, um, you know, undeveloped countries where they, they are in desperate need. Um, what's in it for us? Yeah, well, I mean, on one hand, you could see it, it's, uh, you know, for U.S. foreign policy has long had a, an important role in, let's say, providing international aid, international support. I mean, looking after World War II, the U.S. took the lead uh, in, in helping rebuild Europe, the, you know, the Lend-Lease program, the Marshall Plan and the like. Even in an earlier major pandemic, actually some interesting lessons from the polio vaccine that was developed in the U.S. late 40s into the 50s. Uh, while it is a success story of a vaccination, uh, there's a lot of stumbling that went along, too, in the early stages of that issue. Uh, but more immediately, right now, what we have is an interesting uh, you know, dynamic. Uh, the U.K., the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson... Uh, has uh, pledged 100 million doses over the next year. And the U.S., under Biden, has made a pledge of contributing 500 million doses, which would be the single largest donation of COVID vaccines by any country yet. It is part of our U.S. foreign policy, obviously, to, you know, sort of, a, you know, again, whether you want to call it a you know, humanitarian gesture, development assistance. Now, some will always look at it in more cynical ways. Maybe it's the geopolitical and the game that's being played, you know, paying off Russia or China. There are elements of that, of course. But at the end of the day, too, with the U.S. moving forward in its vaccination program at some point, how can you justify having a massive stockpile? Uh, and the U.S. is not alone. Many other wealthy countries literally bought out the, the supply. And when you look at the poor developing countries of the world, they remain you know, completely you know, out of reach still. Uh, it's just now beginning, uh, but it's going to be you know, probably some time before we see the actual effects. Uh, the bottom line is that there's a lot of dread growing in some of the very poorest countries in the world as we see virus cases surging, more contagious variants that are, you know, taking hold and crippling uh, the shortage of vaccines. So there's a lot of challenges still out there. And I think it's important for us. I mean, we have to look beyond where we are. And so whether our individual states or the nation is doing X or Y, what about the world? Well, I think one of the challenges we're going to see is that uh, while it's one thing to make promises and offer, as we see now, uh, it's going to remain a challenge for many of these poor developing countries to actually implement and carry out the vaccine program. The capacity remains weak. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, it, it's a work in progress. So uh, we're going to continue to see challenges. Well, for sure, we're going to see challenges. And, and uh, I think the world will understand that. In other words, they're not going to, they're not going to hold his feet to the fire on immediate delivery. Um, but I think, you know, a couple of thoughts worth mentioning, Carlos, and that yeah. is, you know, since the uh, Second World War, the United States has been the leader of the free world. It has uh, set the liberal world order. It has um, it brought rationality to many irrational situations. It's been a leadership role. 
uh, you know, high water or low water, good president or bad. We, we have retained that all these years until Trump, when he specifically declined to be the, the leader of the free world and, and uh, you know, dumped on our allies. This is really, and you knew at the time there would be implications and consequences to that. Okay, and I think one of the consequences has been that the world has questioned, has come to question whether we are still the leader of the free world. And it's a legitimate question because, you know, what Trump was doing was backing off that. And, uh, you know, it's hard for some country in Europe to continue to feel that way. And so we're all waiting around for Trump to go. Now he's gone and you have a rational human being in, in the office of president of the United States who understands this and who says, hmm, we, we, we have the legacy of being the leader of the free world. Why don't we step up to that? And this is the perfect way to do it. Not only visiting Europe, not only talking some kind of rational discussion with, uh, with um, Vladimir Putin, but also actually putting your money where your mouth is. And, and I think it's the Marshall Plan of 2021. It's yes. going to buy us <clears throat> its soft power, you know, in, in pure form soft power. And it's going to buy us goodwill everywhere. And what, and what does that mean? I'd like to ask you about that. What does that mean in terms of our ability um, to do multilateral um, strategies with China and with Russia? Um, and these, uh, these things are not directly involving China or Russia, and yet, and yet they do have a likely effect. What would you talk about that, please? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, as you've mentioned this term soft power, we just want to reiterate what that refers to. Traditionally, when we look at global politics, we often envision the, the hard politics to be the give and take, the geopolitics, the sort of military defense, uh, you know, economic. Soft power is a bit more diffuse and it's maybe, you know, things that we do to attract others to us or, or maybe more in aspects of cultural diplomacy, for example, or, you know, Providing again uh, development assistance. Uh, again, uh, you know it's aspects of soft power, but people will debate, you know, how much it is really. Uh, but clearly, the U.S. under the new president is trying to re-engage and, and bring back American diplomacy. Um, there is a challenge, and we don't know how to measure it. But how much is the legacy or the, the impact of the previous administration? In other words, is there more cynicism? Is there more skepticism? That aside, I want to say certainly with the vaccine. At the end of the day, it's it's going to be. Uh, where the, the proof is in the pudding, as you say. In other words, if the U.S. is specifically giving donations to X or Y country, suddenly that becomes the issue. And, and I can tell you, having been most recently in Mexico, for example, uh, Kamala Harris visits, and she comes basically providing some, some, you know, some specific uh, vaccine. Well, that becomes a story. Mexico has more vaccines, boom. And, and it is a positive story. It does help improve the image, no doubt. Uh, I guess what I want to suggest is people at the end are just, you know, since this is about the vaccine, where is it? What is it? And, and how is it going to help us? So I think there's an opportunity for the U.S. to this is in effect, like you suggested, the, the new Marshall Plan of sorts. Um, and yet there's going to be also a healthy skepticism. Moreover, it comes on top of a, a set of diplomatic and geopolitical interests, particularly the Chinese, who, who've been pushing a lot of their vaccines in a lot of developing countries, in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America in particular. Um, so again, it's an ongoing, it is geopolitical. Uh, it is, it has aspects of the sort of hard power because it is that game, but ultimately this is really the U.S. soft power trying to gain, uh, you know, uh, I guess a positive image for the U.S. to improve it. And it's not an easy task given, given what we saw transpire past administration. Yeah, the, the other aspect uh, which we should never ever forget, and there have been a lot of writing about this, is that we're not, we're not over with, with the pandemic. We're not yeah. over with COVID. And even if we were over with COVID, there's another COVID in the pipeline that is going to come and bite us soon. It's the way it is in the world. You know, it's what we've done to the environment. Um, it's the it's the 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 um, the vectors, the animal vectors that have spilled the virus over into our communities because because we've made it impossible for them to live in their communities. So they're closer to our communities, and they carry they carry various viruses. I mean. Bats, for example, carry thousands of viruses, and all you need is one, um, and then you have a pandemic. So um, we can't forget that. And there are a lot of people who have opined that um, we're in a kind of state of pandemic now. It's going to last for a while. And in our lifetimes, I suggest to you, Carlos, we'll, 
will be saddled with um, coronavirus or some other similar virus for the rest of our lives. And yeah. we'll have to take shots. And I'm happy to see that um, that there are there are companies out there that are that are putting the vaccine in pills, which will be a tremendous improvement uh, yeah. over shots. And you know, and the uh, America will be a leading feature in the in the biotechnology in the pharmaceutical technology that allows us to do this. However, <clears throat> however, if you have a certain percentage of the community, and we still do have a substantial percentage of the American population that either doesn't want to or can't take a, a vaccine, you have the risk of infection um, about people, uh, you know, in, in people who are unable to take a vaccine, you know. And the other is that you have a substantially enhanced risk of variants that will break through the vaccine. Yeah. Now, luckily, you know, they say that most of the two, sh the two shot vaccines, I guess that means uh, Pfizer, um, you know, are able to deal with the Delta variant that has come to us from mm -hmm. India. Yeah. Um, but there might be another one. There will, I'm going to say there will be another one if we have the whole developing world involving hundreds of millions of people, billions of people who have not been um, vac vaccinated. And, and in their cases, among their cases, it's just natural law, there will be new variants. And what happened in 1918 and 19 was that we sent the Spanish flu off to Europe and, um, uh, um, and it, it, it did very well there. And then when our troops came back, in um, 1918, they brought the, the new version back, and then we had a, even a more serious uh, epidemic in the United States. Mm, yeah. um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm only suggesting all of this because I think that it is in our interest uh, to limit the number of cases everywhere in the world because that is a limitation um, of the possibility of variants. Sure, yeah. No, the bottom line is, look, and, and health tech experts and different world leaders have been warning this, even if the rich nations immunize all their people, and, you know, maybe not all, but a substantial, you know, herd immunity, all that, the pandemic will not be defeated if the virus is allowed to spread in countries that are starved of vaccines. And so there's a, a compelling case where we need to address it. And, and again, the challenge is in many parts of the world. It could be in Africa, Latin America, Asia, et cetera. But I would add that Africa is especially vulnerable. This is a continent where, you know, they've got over 1.3 billion people, maybe 18 percent of the population. But the, the same place has only received about two percent of the vaccines that have been administered globally. So it has been a, you know, a fraction. Uh, and some African countries have yet to dispense a single shot. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, just this is one of those global issues that is not going to go away until we address it globally. The opportunity is there, too, now, even to foster more collaboration and cooperation, even among parties, let's say the U.S., China, the U.S., Russia, where we have tensions and difficulties. At the end of the day, we do need to cooperate and coordinate on something like this. It's in everybody's interest. This is a global issue that transcends borders and, and the like. Uh, and so, gosh, you know, uh, let's hope that we can bring together our collective, uh, you know, abilities. Yeah, that's, um, that's one thing of a little concern is that the U.S., um, you know, we're going to give away half a billion uh, doses and all that. But as you mentioned, uh, China has been giving away doses. And for that matter, until it had its own, you know, variant problem, uh, India was giving away doses. Yeah. And Russia, you know, I don't know how good their technology is. They were giving away doses in small sure. amounts. And the question is, um, you know, how, how do we, there's a competition, isn't there? In a given country, I mean, for example, China has a huge uh, presence in, in Africa where they need it badly. Yeah, if yeah. China wanted to do soft power in Africa, it'd be so easy for them to go into countries they already have a, a much more significant presence there than we do. You know, their, their presence is building harbors and dams and infrastructure. Ours is uh, sending uh, NGOs in. It's different. Um, and, it, it, you know, unless we keep up with them, uh, that competition, it, it, we're not going to be able to really succeed in that no. competition. So time is of the essence, and it's uh, the nature of the way we do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, there is a competition, don't you agree? 
Yeah, no, there is. And and even, let me say, a couple of months back, what we saw more was this example of uh, what we call the vaccine nationalism. Countries were sort of, you know, circling the wagon and kind of looking out for their own narrow interest. Today, the dynamics are changing. And, and this last summit meeting uh, this past week, the G7 uh, group of countries was quite important because it was a meeting that uh, helped to speed up a focus on the donation of vaccines. And so we've got these new commitments, the US, the UK, and other, and again, uh, several others. Japan has also pledged, as typical, writing a big fat check to help finance some of it. Uh, Germany, France, Italy, and Sweden have also promised you know, additional you know, 100 billion doses and the like. So I don't know, it, it is certainly encouraging that we're moving in that way. Interestingly, China is not up there making massive commitments. And yet, as you know, I mean, they're the ones that have very deep ties, especially in Africa, especially in parts of South America where there are you know, leading investors. So they have a vested interest if they want those resources, that infrastructure development that they've been you know, developing. Uh, they have an interest in seeing these populations overcome the virus too. Uh, I'm curious to see that they have not taken a lead in you know massive donations. But let me add this though: they have been they have been doing a lot of trials, in, including in Latin America, of, of some of their vaccines. So they are working in these places, definitely. Yeah. Well, one thing one thing that strikes me is that you know I think we can agree that in Africa and South America, the Chinese have developed an advantage over us because they have these. Yeah, they have belt, their foot in the belt, door. Yeah, they have the foot in the door. They have mm -hmm. belt road type projects going on. Mm -hmm. They're lending a lot of money. They're granting a lot of money. They're sending sure. in engineers and managers down there. And, and th this is very valuable to them. But let me say that we're still in a competition with them there. Yeah. And we can, we can tend to get our foot back in the door mm -hmm. by, by doing the Biden initiative and delivering uh, this kind of special health care, these vaccinations to those countries. All of a sudden, you know, I think we have the possibility of, of um, equalizing the playing field in countries where right now, today, if you look at it, uh, China is ahead of us. What do you think about that possibility? It is there, absolutely. And so again, it's a window of opportunity. The U.S. is a, it's got in front of it now. And I go back to this again, at the end of the day, the countries themselves, while they are playing off this geopolitical game, they're they're going to go with whatever's delivered. If the U.S. shows up with fifty, you know, thousand or a hundred, whatever it is, the Chinese show up. That's what matters. They, they're, you know, for the political leaders, their ability to deliver the goods is is first and foremost. And again, with Mexico, interesting because the U.S. has donated some, but only lately. Instead, you have a lot of the European, the, the AstraZeneca, and you have the Chinese. Uh, they have several vaccines that they've been, and the Russians. They are in Mexico in a curious way that the U.S. has been sort of missing the boat. Uh, but that is, there's a dynamic that's changing now. Uh, we'll see how this plays out. But uh, I want to say that at the end of the day, public health ministers and political leaders, they want the goods. And, and you know, where they come from is almost secondary. Yeah. And so this is going to accelerate. As you said, we're in a different time now. We had uh, COVID vaccination yeah. nationalism. Yes, now yes. we have globalism. And that yeah. means that not only will the U.S. deliver what it can, I hope it, it's soon for our own benefit, but it's going to encourage, uh, incentivize others to do the same. So what we will have is a, a whole bunch of countries uh, delivering vaccines to developing world countries. This, yeah. is, this is all good. And so he gets points for that. Even just to you know, make the commitment, he gets points. But let me, mm -hmm. let me go to another part of this, and that is, we know that because of this soft power and this, uh, you know, extension of the, of the commitment, um, we know that's good for American, you know, the, the American image and leadership in the world. We know that. And, uh, of course, he's got to follow through and play that out. But um, I think it's already established that we're back. We're back. Um, the, other, the other thing, though, is what does this mean in terms of American politics? Call it the reverberating effect. What does it mean that, you know, the papers are filled with his, you know, decency in, 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 in serving this, making this gift to the third world? Um, does it mean that people who maybe weren't so excited about him get more excited? Um, does it mean that more Democrats will like him? Does it mean that some Republicans will like him? Does it mean that he might be able to change the, um, uh, the vote? In 2022 or 2024, um, does it mean that the uh, the recalcitrance in in Congress, the Republican senators, for example, 
will will take a piece out of that page and compare him to Trump, who is, uh, you know, not the same kind of individual. Yeah. Well, boy, all those are, you know, very difficult to, to nail down. We've got such a polarized environment and, and even this issue of vaccinations continues to be a divisive one, uh, you know, separating, you know, the anti-vaxxers and those that maybe continue to believe, you know, uh, uh, I guess in the so-called big lie of, of, of the past election. So I, I would go back to, I think we continue to have a very, you know, different narratives happening, let's say. And how much is this going to persuade those that are firmly in one camp or the other? I don't know. Um, and at the end of the day, too, Americans are not always real keen on, you know, foreign policy and even development aid. So we always have in surveys, you know, Americans think that we give away, you know, 10% of our gross national product. In the end, we give a pretty small amount, even though it's substantial and for some countries a lot. But our overall, you know, impact in terms of, you know, our, let's say, uh, even these vaccines, they're, they are substantial, but they're, you know, they're really uh, a fraction of what we have bought. And uh, so, gosh, I don't know. But I'm my, thinking out loud, my first thought is, I don't know that it's going to change a lot of minds. But it does reflect, again, the U.S., as you said, it is back. It's certainly engaging. American diplomacy is back, and we're doing what traditionally we have done and what we have done in the past as leaders, trying to do it again. And yet, who knows, the, these past years, it's probably going to be a healthy dose of skepticism in some places. Uh, but my first takeaway, again, from the, leader, the meeting of these past week in, in Europe, uh, overall, the Europeans certainly are pleased to see the U.S. back and engaged. Uh, and... Uh, you know, this rollout of this vaccine, the donations the U.S. and others are making is an important necessary step to, to continue, uh, you know, global cooperation on this pandemic. Uh, I think the real risk is that we get too relaxed at home. We think it's over. Everybody else is in the same boat. Well, guess what? They're not. And uh, it's going to be some time before other places can reach, a, let's say, a, a level of, uh, I don't know what I called it at the outset, this post-pandemic world. Uh, that we're kind of in already here, but even there, it's kind of yes and no. Uh, but having traveled and been out of the country and back in, I can tell you right now, the U.S. is kind of on this period of, well, many places are thinking it's all behind us now and it's done. Uh, and it's not. It's going to continue to fester. And until we address the other world, uh, I don't like that term third world because it's, you know, the, the other world, you know, and that, that means everything. Uh, South America, you know, Africa many parts of Asia, even parts of Europe, uh, you know, less developed parts that are perhaps not as far along as other areas. Uh, this is going to be a continual process. Um, we, yeah, it, it won't be a quick, quick fix. <laughs> let's, let's assume that over time it does work, okay? And I'm, I'm focusing in my mind on, uh, on uh, Uganda for now. We, we had a, a show last week with uh, a, uh, a, a, an idealist, if you will, um, who is involved in an organization out of Hawaii, actually called Project Expedite Justice, to try to deal with atrocities and violations of human rights in Uganda. Wow. But there are other countries in Africa that are in the same ballpark, uh, Sudan, um, Congo, um, in years past, Rwanda, that, that sort of thing. And, and there's a lot of there's a lot of problems to be solved. Okay? These countries are faced with climate change. They're faced with not only COVID, but other diseases. They're faced with economic um, you know, failure, political failure, um, a tragedy. You failed countries, they are. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and I, I suppose to a lesser extent, you find that in South America. Uh, but let's, let's focus on Uganda just for a moment. It seems to me, and they're conflicted about accepting uh, handouts from mm -hmm. Europe, from the yeah. US. They're conflicted about allowing officials in to you know, interface with their government, who may or may not be completely democratic. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, they got a lot of risks and challenges to get back to some kind of normalcy here, like COVID and many other things. So my question to you is, so, I'm Joe Biden, and I walk into Uganda, and I deliver lots of doses, and I vaccinate the public, even when they really haven't been vaccinated, and I save a lot of lives, and I show him the, you know, the, the charitable nature of, of the American foreign policy, and I help, and I help in a kind of altruistic way with, without expecting anything in return and so forth. Um, 
what does this mean for a place like Uganda? Is this going to help Uganda get on its feet? Is this going to help people in Uganda think differently about not only you know, the US support, but their own prospects going forward, their own ability to create a better government, a better economy, a better society? Um, does it, is it going to have a shot, in, I hate to use this term, a shot in the arm effect on them? Yeah, boy, that's, a, you know, it's not easy to answer. It really depends. Because, I mean, you choose a country like Uganda, and this is a place that, like so many in, in sub-Saharan Africa, they are fighting a sharp rise in cases. They're seeing an array of different variants. And we're talking about public health, uh, in many cases, public health systems that are relatively weak, underserved, and, and, and yeah, well, just lots of capacity issues. Uh, and the other dynamic, and this is specifically in Uganda and some of these other neighboring countries, the real people affected are in their 20s and 30s. It's hitting, you know, the working populations that, that adds a lot of, you know, difficulty to it. Um, you know, and we're seeing in, in places like Kampala, Uganda, the intensive care units themselves are now almost full. Again, the story repeating itself. Now, having said all that, but of course, help is, is, is it's good and, and it will help. Um, but is it going to turn it around? Uh, it's hard to say. There's a lot of political dynamics going on. I think uh, we're just going to see a lot of unevenness, just as we've, we've seen throughout this, uh, this um, pandemic, some places more effective than others, uh, some success stories here and there. Uh, let's hope that uh, the, from this whole experience, we're going to see and be able to step back and, and draw lessons on what needs to be done. How do you handle those countries that have the weakest capacities? Where we don't and, you know, I'm not the scientist uh, in understanding that, but there's obviously certain strategies that are going to work better in certain places. Um, and what is the role of the international community? You know, can it come in and actually help? Or as a lot of these places, you know, they're frustrated. Decades and decades of, you know, development assistance. All too often, it's just like lands in their lap, but they're not given, let's say, I don't know, the proper uh, power, authority, or even to develop their own capacity. Uh, you know, the famous story of, you know, do we just bring them goods or do we teach them how to, you know, take care of things better on their own? There's certainly a role for the international community in all of these poorest countries because we have the resources, we have the, the goods, we have the vaccines. They're not going to come out of these places. Uh, so, gosh, uh, uh, it's going to be uneven, unfortunately, uh, and, and that's the reality we're going to continue to see. Now, let, me, uh, let me ask you a follow-up question about the follow-up. Um, okay, let's say we deliver to Uganda or any number of other countries in Africa, you know, who are in trouble. Um, and um, is, does it end there? It seems to me that this kind of diplomacy, this kind of global leadership, regardless of what the Trump base may think about here in the United States, at least initially, um, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for a lot of people in this country who will admire Joe Biden and who will rise to the moral occasion of it uh, if he follows through. And I'm thinking, I know this is a long shot, I'm thinking of a kind of follow-up to this. It's not just dropping vaccines all over, it's following up. It's, you know, if you were the, the Chinese, you'd follow up and build a dam or a harbor. Um, but if you're Americans, you would, you would send in a kind of updated Peace Corps, wouldn't you? Uh, you, would, you would send in young people who are interested in seeing the world, uh, having an adventure, learning about places. Um, and I believe there's a whole generation of American kids who would be up for that. But do you think that could be done? Do you think the result would be positive? Well, again, we have a long history of, uh, as you mentioned, Peace Corps and other development uh, programs that have taken you know, both not just money, but personnel. Um, right now, it's fair to say that the U.S. has scaled back so much of that that it, there's no easy quick fix and turnaround. And, and in many of these countries, we have been missing in action for quite some time, uh, Africa and Latin America particularly, uh, and in a, such a way that China has filled that void. Uh, as you've noted already, a lot of infrastructure development, a lot of you know, foreign investment, particularly in places that have natural resources, you know, the, the mines in Bolivia or Peru. The Chinese are there. So on one hand, the U.S. has a challenge that we've been missing. So we do need to be there. And that's not going to be overnight. I mean, diplomacy has to be built. And, and you know, we saw a pretty severe hitting of American diplomacy in these past years. Uh, you can't just rebuild it overnight. So I think, you know, down the road, we might see that. Uh, but how, how easy is it going to be for the U.S. to be reengaged in Africa, 
re-engage in Latin America. Uh, I think it's going to be tough. And in the end, we have to pick and choose. You know, maybe right now the focus will be on the Central American cases because that's the hot issue of the day, you know, dealing with migration, dealing with you know, the border control. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, the Chinese are very much continuing a, a, a stronger presence and role in places that used to be the U.S. You know, area of influence. Uh, so no, I, I, again, while yes, it, it, there's some you know, a positive move and the U.S. is reaching out with this new initiative, but it remains to be seen if it's going to be enduring, if it's going to be with results right away. Is it going to change the image of the U.S.? Well, again, uh, these are things that we do measure. The Pew Research Center regularly gives us you know, views on the image of the U.S. and the world, and they have improved, no doubt, not just among the elites, but even the population at large. And, and so overall, I think it's, it's a positive, uh, but it's going to take time to see the outcome. Well, it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, sort of like um, the Chinese have taught us that um, you have to look at both sides of the equation all the time. Internally, you know, your, uh, you know, your economy, your, way your country is being run internally, um, and also your place in the world um, in terms of business and everything else, geopolitical. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, Trump abandoned that notion. And uh, in just sort of his nationalism, he abandoned the second part of the equation. But if you believe, and I, and I think you and I both do, that you, know, you need both. You need both to be, uh, to be the United States. You need both to be a world leader. You need both to have the reserve currency and the trading advantages and so forth. Um, then, then you have to learn, although I think we forgot it, you have to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time. You think yeah. we can do that? Uh, well, again, uh, yes, on some level. And, and that's the nature of our world. We've got like you know, five or six chess games going on at the same time. And, and you see it even in the, the recent diplomacy, dealing with Russia, dealing with China. There are going to be disagreements and, and issues that are going to just not be resolved. You have to accept that. And that's the nature of international negotiation. You know, agree on the things you can. The ones you can't, maybe you agree to disagree, but you still work on other things. And, uh, you know, here this vaccine uh, program presents an opportunity for the world community, the world leaders, to somehow put aside some of those intractable differences and say, look, let's agree on a few things. We, it's in our best of interest to see this pandemic get solved, you know, and who, and, and we have to work with it together. Uh, the Chinese have a role. Uh, they've got vaccines and they've got infrastructure in place. Uh, so they do have a role there to play. Uh, the Russians in their own way as well. Uh, but in a way where let's all get at the table rather than doing our own individual things. The G7 right now was this most recent example of a multilateral forum that has to continue, and it, and it does. It, it goes on in different forms. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think we're moving more in that way. We're back to the, in some way, the same old boring diplomacy, which doesn't always have results, can't always be measured. But look, it's better to be talking and having collaboration because the absence of that is, is not, it, it's worse. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that things are going to be better now and that hopefully we can draw back lessons learned for futures because the pandemics, they'll be back. Uh, they're not going to be gone forever. Yes, and, and decency doesn't stop at the border. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not ideally, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. Carlos Juarez, East-West Center. Wonderful to talk to you. Welcome back. Well, welcome home. Aloha. Aloha.